explain what that would cause, Kevin, the uh, U.S. allies or other countries in the region who would not be susceptible uh, to that um, uh, language, who wouldn't believe him, um, and who would still feel threatened, what kinds of actions would they then take in response to that? The thing that's always frightened me most about the North Korean nuclear capability is where it spins to over time in terms of nuclear proliferation more widely across the Asia-Pacific region, which is already uh, Asia spends more on its military than Europe does. So uh, when you're starting to look at uh, a map which shows where military hardware exists in the world, it's rapidly become a trans-Pacific map rather than a transatlantic map in terms of the aggregation of, let's call it, military capabilities. And in the region, we also have a whole lot of unresolved territorial questions as well. Now, over the top of that, you then have uh, an unresolved uh, nuclear question concerning the North. What do other regional states then do in response to the scenario we've just described if you're cut, high and, le cut and left high and dry by your American ally? Mm -hmm. Victor will be able to speak better in terms of how this will unfold in South Korean politics. Uh, it will depend on who's the government of South Korea at a particular time. The centre-left and the centre-right there will have different perspectives on this. But prior to this uh, summitry occurring, there was already support in South Korean opinion polls to the level of 67% of South Korea obtaining its own nuclear capability. Now, flip to Japan, which has its post-war uh, constitution, and, um, and Abe-san's uh, 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 attitude to normalising Japan as a post-war international power and military power um, I think what it does over time in Japan is it builds a much stronger impetus towards Japan beginning to consider medium term its own nuclear option as well. And no one should be under any illusions about how quick a process it is for advanced um, industrial economies like, frankly, Japan, South Korea, Australia to become nuclear within a matter of months if that's what you wanted to do. We choose not to for a whole range of other reasons. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th th and this raises an um, interesting point, but we don't, which we don't have the answer to, but it's worth raising, which is, you know, is President Trump in dealing with this North Korea issue, is ultimately, is his goal to actually try to solve the problem in terms mm -hmm. of complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization? <clears throat> or is it to half solve the problem, declare peace, and then get out? Um, <clears throat> um, the president's views on, for example, U.S. troops in Korea, we have 28,500 U.S. troops in Korea, uh, going back to the 1990s has been very clear. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand why we have them there, why we pay uh, half, the bi half the annual bill. The South Koreans pay the other half of keeping them there. Um, <clears throat> and, and so I, I, I worry a little bit about that, but at the same time, I can understand intuitively the argument. Right, which is, this is what the, the North Koreans have developed an incredibly large nuclear weapons program that is buried deep in thousands of miles of tunnels that we will never be able to permanently dismantle unless we occupy the country with 350,000 troops. Um, and we don't want to do that. Um, and in the meantime, they are advancing capabilities that now directly threaten us. So I can, there is, some, there is a logic there to why the president may want to meet the leader, become friends with him, invite him to Mar-a-Lago, you know, declare peace, get some sort of freeze, and then get out of Dodge so that it's not a US problem anymore. 